All right, so in this video, we're going to be going over the circular motion lab for Physics 185 at the University of Rhode Island. So we're going to try to demonstrate circular motion using this setup right here. So we have a motorized setup, and we have all these gears, which are going to move uh, this top part right here in varying speeds, which we can adjust. So it's going to turn this gear at a set rate, but we can uh, raise and lower this part here to actually get a higher velocity for this part up here. So what this part up here has with this little rotating system is we have a mass on a, on a spring here. So the point is, as we go faster and faster, this spring will be displaced as it's trying to fling this mass more towards the outer edge of the circular path that's going to be traveling. So what we're looking for here is we're trying to see how fast we need to get this to go to get this all the way to the end. And we're going to do that by, uh, like I said, adjusting the velocity of this device more and more until there's a little little arrow right here, right in the center. So we're going to wait and see for that. We want this arrow to be above this little knob right here. So we're going to increase the speed more and more until we can see that arrow flip into the upward position. Once that happens, we'll know that we've actually hit enough speed, enough velocity, mind you, actually, to get this all the way to the end. So that's how we'll know we've hit the correct amount of centrifugal force needed to get it to a distance that we already know and we want. I'm going to turn the motor on right now. And you can see it's not moving too fast right now, and the arrow is still in the downward position. But what we're going to do is we can slowly increase this more and more. So you can move it up or down. So if we move it down, we're actually increasing the velocity more and more. So ultimately, we've got to get to a point until you see that arrow flip in the upper position. You want to get exactly on to that one point. So you have to go back and forth a little bit until you find the exact speed at which it makes that transition. So after that, we want to see if we can measure the velocity of this, because that's how we're going to relate this back to centripetal force. So centripetal force is related to the velocity squared of your moving circular path divided by the radius of it. So that's what we're trying to find here. So we're going to do that by, on the side here, we have a little counter. So if you push inward on the counter, it starts to count upward and upward. So it counts how many revolutions you're doing of that circular path in a certain amount of time. So experimentally, you're going to have a stopwatch. You're going to set it for 10 seconds. So you're going to make note of what number you're on on the dial when you start. Click your stopwatch, press it in, wait 10 seconds, and then after those 10 seconds have passed, you're going to note the new number on the side. So that'll tell you how many rotations you've done in that 10 seconds. And from the rotations, if you multiply that number of rotations by the circumference of the circular path, you will then have the distance you've traveled. So dividing that distance by the time it took should give you a velocity. And so experiments are going to do that about five times so we have a good solid average of what this velocity is going to be. While the main point of the overall experiment is to measure centripetal force, we do need something to compare that to. And since it's all related to the force on this spring and how it's extending as it's moving in a circular path, we're going to try a different way of measuring that force in the spring, this time involving gravity. So, to get something to compare your centripetal force calculations to, you're going to remove the spring setup from the moving parts, and we're going to hang it on this structure right here. And now what we're going to do is we're going to add weights and a pulley, like so. And like we did in the main part of the experiment, as we're seeing for this needle to flick up as it's spinning and spinning and spinning, what that really means is that the weight has hit the end. So that's how we knew when we hit our full extension of that full radius. So now what you're going to do is repeatedly add weights, like so, until you see that needle flick upward again. So that will indicate that now we've hit the same amount of force needed to flick up that needle as we did during the centripetal force part of the experiment. So if the gravitational weight, uh, sorry, the gravitational force needed to make this spring pop up after the weight is fully extended, if that value is the same as what we had for the centripetal force, then we will know that our centripetal force calculations were most likely 
correct. So that's how we're comparing things. So with these experiments, you always want something to compare to. So same thing, once you have the needle in the upright position, you'll know you've had enough mass. Okay. So once you've added enough weight onto the, uh, onto the spring, you'll see that needle flick into the upward position and that's how you'll know that the spring is now fully extended to the same distance it was when we had it running on the motor and we had hit with the centripetal force. So those two values, the centripetal force and the gravitational force, are in close agreement, we can likely uh, rule our experiment as a success and that we've accurately described the centripetal force through the use of this engine apparatus here.